Good morning, guys. Good to see you this morning. Hopefully you got your coffee ready to go, but it is 6.32, so I, I want to get started so that we accomplish everything in an hour uh, like we do. So let me go ahead and open our time in prayer, and we'll get started. Father, thank you. Uh, thank you for this morning, and especially as we were driving in, the, the beautiful sunrise and the beautiful colors in the sky. Uh, Lord, we were reminded that you are a great artist. Uh, you, you do all things well. Uh, surely this world, though it is bound in, uh, in chains because of our sin to decay, it's still a beautiful world that you've made, and we bless you for that. We bless you, too, for Holy Scripture, which is beautifully made as well under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You spoke forth these words through your servant Paul in such a way that great truth and great beauty sit side by side, even as we consider the bad news uh, that precedes the good news of the gospel we see how this has been put together with such care, such creativity, uh, and such importance. So, Lord, please open our eyes of faith that we might see glorious riches in this portion of your gospel and grant us your grace, we ask. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. So just remember next time as you're using the study guide uh, by Jared Wilson, next time we get to chapter 3, verse 21, to chapter 4, verse 25, uh, the section that deals particularly with uh, things connected to justification by faith alone. Uh, but today, um, following the outline that I gave you the very first week, today we're looking at what I'm calling bad news. Um, because in order for us to really grasp the importance of the good news, the gospel, uh, we have to understand that there's bad news. Uh, and the bad news that Paul presents to us here uh, is God's judicial wrath for sin. And the, the way this section from chapter 1, verse 18 to chapter 3, verse 20 breaks down, um, you read first about God's judicial wrath against the immortal, excuse me, the immoral Gentile. Then in chapter 2, through the first part of chapter 3, God's wrath against the moral Jew uh, or the Jewish moralist. Uh, and then finally, chapter 3, verse 9 to verse 20, God's wrath against all humankind. Uh, so whether immoral Gentile, moral Jew, whoever you are, God's judicial wrath uh, hangs over us. And we, we get that from the very first verse of the section in Romans 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. That, that verse really is the controlling verse for this entire section the bad news is that God's judicial wrath hangs over us. Um, it has been revealed from heaven, uh, and it is our fundamental problem. Um, actually, there's two problems that are mentioned in verse 18. God's wrath is one, and human unrighteousness is the other, and they are obviously connected together. The wrath of God is revealed. That, that language there, it's interesting, it parallels right in the... Uh, a, a phrase from the previous verse. In chapter 1, verse 17, you have this language, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And then the very next verse, the wrath of God is revealed. Whenever you see those parallelisms uh, in your New Testament, or really in the Bible in general, uh, they show up most particularly in the Psalms, but they show up elsewhere throughout Scripture. Whenever you see those parallels or parallelisms, it's a clue in terms of what's going on theologically. Paul says the righteousness of God is revealed, the wrath of God is revealed. That parallel is no accident. Um, part of the way that God's righteousness is revealed is in his wrath. So what do we mean when, or what does Paul mean when he talks about then the wrath of God? Uh, what we have to do in, in understanding that phrase, the wrath of God, is banish any idea that we might have taken over, say, from Greek mythology, uh, that, that God is some kind of petulant deity, um, like the stories that were told of Zeus and Apollos, where they get angry with one another and do all kinds of things toward one another, and God's up there with his thunderbolts ready to strike people. That, that's not the language, that's not the idea behind the wrath of God. Um, what is God's wrath, then? Well, one writer put it this way, you have it in the box, God is the creator and lover of the world. This God has a passionate concern for creation and humans in particular that will tolerate nothing less than the best for them. And the result is wrath, 
not just settled hostility toward idolatry and immortality, excuse me, or immorality, but actions that follow from such an attitude when the one to whom it belongs is the sovereign creator. So there's a sense in which the wrath of God, underlying the, the wrath of God, is a passionate care for his creation and his, his frustration, his hostility, when that creation uh, performs wrongly or acts wrongly. Um, we all know this. Uh, right now, we are in the midst of dealing with my son's football injury. He's got a shoulder thing. He's getting an MRI today. Uh, and Sarah has been very much mama bear. Uh, any suggestion from the coaches that he might be slacking off uh, or is not, in fact, hurt or the doctors are not, in fact, holding him back causes her to experience some measure of wrath. Yesterday, I was um, sitting there on the couch saying, baby, it's all right. Calm down. It's going to be okay, right? Mama, you mess with Mama Bear's cubs, right? There's wrath that, that emerges. Uh, well, there's something like that in this language here, that there's a deep, passionate concern and care for his creation that causes God to have hostility toward anything that would damage it. But there's also, because he's not just sovereign creator, but sovereign Lord, a judicial aspect to this as well. That, that as the rightful king, uh, as the creator of the world, God has all authority to not just express hostility, but to actually do something about it judicially, to bring condemnation against all that which stands against his good purposes for his world. And when does that happen? When does God exercise his judgment? Well, according to the Old Testament scriptures as well as the New Testament scripture, fully and finally that occurs at the end of the age. Jesus himself said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. John 5, I am the judge. Judgment has been, um, has been given to the Son. He is the one who will call the dead forth, and he is the one who will judge the secrets of men. So when does the wrath of God get fully expressed judicially? When is that hostility against all the damages creation get dealt with finally? At the end of the age. With the judgment of God. So when you read that word, that language of the wrath of God is revealed, what we should be thinking about is his judicial wrath against sin and sinning. This is not some kind of uh, petulant frustration. Uh, this isn't even the kind of uh, anger or wrath that sometimes we experience no, this is a settled hostility that expresses itself judicially against all that damages God's world. And so, why is the wrath of God revealed from heaven? Well, Paul says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And those, those two words, ungodliness and unrighteousness, um, they, they express similar things, but there is some difference. Ungodliness displays human unrighteousness vertically. Uh, when we are ungodly, we are disregarding God's rights over us and his world as Lord. But unrighteousness expresses and displays human unrighteousness vertically. We disregard others' rights as those created in God's image and ultimately under his lordship. Uh, and so, uh, both vertically and horizontally, human beings display unrighteousness. And God's judicial wrath, his settled judgment, his condemnation is revealed against all that that stands against God, whether vertically or horizontally. So you can see why this is bad news. <laughs> that, that, that there is a judicial wrath there is a, a coming judgment day. It's been revealed from heaven against all human unrighteousness, whether vertically or horizontally. But also this judicial wrath stands against the confusion that is the result of human unrighteousness. That's probably the most noted uh, part of this first section is the kinds of confusion that result because of ungodliness uh, and unrighteousness. There's, there's spiritual confusion. Um, in verse 19, what has been known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, 
So they're without excuse, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. And so because human beings have uh, wrongly uh, engaged vertically and horizontally, um, displayed human unrighteousness horizontally and vertically, um, they've experienced spiritual confusion. Uh, We've exchanged the basic truths that even the creation reveals concerning who God is. We've exchanged that for what? Idolatry. Um, we've, and that language of exchange is important. It's going to show up in verse 23. Human beings exchange uh, the glory of God, uh, the glory of the immoral God for images. And then God's going to give us over. He's going to exchange human beings in such a way that he gives them over uh, to their heart's desires. And that language shows up again. Verse 23 exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images. Verse 24, God gave them up to the lust of their hearts. Why? Verse 25, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie. Verse 26, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Why? Well, how? For their, their women exchanged natural relations for those contrary to nature. Uh, and the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. That's the same word in the original language over and again. Exchanged, 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 exchanged. And exchange, it, it sh- that word shows the kind of confusion that, that, is, that is the result of human unrighteousness, of our native sinfulness. We, we're wrongly related vertically. We deny and disregard God's rights over us as Lord. We're unrighteous vertically, and the result is confusion, spiritual confusion, but, but also sexual confusion. Um, verses 24 to 27 speak of this. God, because human beings in their unrighteousness exchange the truth about God for lies, God exchanges us, if you will. He gives us up to the lusts of our hearts, to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves. Um, and then the greatest example of this confusion, Paul says, Um, is homosexuality and lesbianism. In verses 26 and 27, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. Their women exchanged natural relations for that contrary to nature. The men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. Paul really is saying, though it's politically incorrect to say today, he really is saying that part of the confusion that results from disregarding God's rights over us as Lord is is sexual confusion displayed in homosexuality and lesbianism. He really is saying that. There's been all sorts of of ways that uh, even liberal Christian scholars who want to make room for homosexuality have, have approached this section, saying, well, you know, Paul... He didn't know committed monogamous homosexual relations. That that just wasn't present in the first century. That's not true. There actually were committed uh, uh, monogamous homosexual relations in the first century. Paul was aware of them. Um, You could not be unaware of them in the first century. He was aware of them. That's not what's going on here. What he is saying, he really is saying, is when we exchange, when we we set aside, when we disregard God's lordship over us, this vertical ungodliness and this horizontal unrighteousness, it gets expressed in all sorts of confusion. Spiritual confusion, yes, but but also sexual confusion. And the, 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 the most obvious picture of sexual confusion, Paul says, is homosexuality and lesbianism. But there's also social confusion. Verses 28 to 32, uh, you have this long list of different vices, which is common in Paul's writings, these vice lists. Uh, and they break down in a variety of ways. There's, there's economic disorder. Um, he says in verse 29, um, they were filled with all matter of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, and malice, various forms of economic disorder. There's social disorder. Uh, They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness, family breakdown, um, gossips, um, or excuse me, disobedient to parents, um, relational breakdown, gossips, slanders, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil. And then the sum of the whole of all this social confusion, foolish 
weakness, faithlessness, heartlessness, ruthlessness. That's our world, isn't it? I mean, when you, when you think about all of this disorder, economic disorder, social disorder, family breakdown, relational breakdown, and the sum of the whole foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, that's our world. Um, just this morning, get up, get my cup of coffee. We get both the Commercial Appeal and the Wall Street Journal and thumb my way through them before I leave this morning. And what do you find on every page? <laughs> you find these things. Well, why? Well, it's because of the ungodliness and unrighteousness of human beings. Uh, the, the, the vertical denial of God's lordship over us that results in human unrighteousness expressed towards one another, it creates all sorts, the results, all sorts of confusion. Spiritual confusion, sexual confusion, but also this social confusion that is life in this world. Uh, and it's why God's judicial wrath is coming. God has a settled hostility toward all that brings harm to his world. He will judge it. Now, that's, that's bad news, ultimately. For the Christian, it is good news. For those who know Jesus Christ and know that he's the judge and knows that he, he's the Savior, it's a good thing that judgment's coming. Right? We, we wouldn't want to live in a world where there is not justice in the end. We wouldn't want to live in a world where the story of the world was just endless hostility to God with no judgment day. There is a sense in which the wrath of God being revealed is a good thing. But in the context of Paul's argument, which sets up problem and solution, um, the problem for all of us as human beings is that the wrath of God is revealed. And the first part of this, of this argument that Paul is making here is that the, the wrath of God is revealed against immoral Gentiles. But it's not as though moral people or religious people can simply tut-tut against the world and say, well, yeah, we live in an awful world. And those pagans over there, those Gentiles over there, uh, they deserve everything they get. God's judicial wrath certainly should come uh, against those pagans. Uh, we might even have the mindset of, of certainly God's judgment should come upon San Francisco or Los Angeles or New York, but against us Christian folk in Memphis, not at all, right? Paul moves on to say, no, 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 no. Uh, don't, don't go there. Uh, he's, he's going to begin in chapter 2, verse 1. And to continue this theme, God's judicial wrath is revealed not just against the immoral Gentile. God's wrath is also revealed against the Jewish moralist. He says in chapter 2, verse 1, Therefore you have no excuse, O man. Every one of you who judges... For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the same things. If we stand in the position of the moralist and tut-tut against the ungodly around us, Paul comes back and says, wait a second, you deserve judgment too. Why? Well, he gives three reasons in the first five verses of chapter 2. In the first, he's already, you've already gotten a taste of, and it's hypocrisy. He says in verse 2, we know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge uh, those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? There's a fundamental hypocrisy uh, that even each moralist has to wrestle with. On the one side, we might, might look at this world and say it certainly deserves judgment, but, but we deserve judgment too because fundamentally we're hypocrites. We may not uh, go to the same kinds of sexual confusion or spiritual confusion. We may not display the same kind of disorder and social confusion that Paul describes in, in the previous section, but every single one of us descended from Adam and Eve, every single one of us has displayed unrighteousness towards God, ungodliness, and we've displayed unrighteousness toward one another. We've, we've disregarded God's rights over us as sovereign Lord, and we've disregarded others' rights as creating God's image. And so, we're hypocrites in the end if we simply say, well, they deserve judgment, but I'm in a position in which uh, I'm safe. I don't deserve judgment. No, Paul says, uh, if you judge, we know uh, that those who judge uh, and yet practice such things, they too will come under the judgment of God. So hypocrisy is one reason for judgment coming. 
But another is presumption. In verse 4, Paul says, Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? It very well may be that because of family training, because of uh, social location, uh, that we, we don't go to the same lengths of sin that we see, say, in the immoral pagan. Um, we may be those who fly right, do better, who tell the truth and pay our bills on time and hard workers. Um, and yet, that's, that's not of ourselves. That's actually evidence of God's kindness that's meant to lead us to repentance. But rather than coming to repentance and trusting in this God who's shown himself in Jesus Christ, what do we do? We presume that we've earned our own salvation. We've provided a, a safe place for ourselves from judgment, even as we judge others and say they deserve the wrath of God. That's presumption. We're presuming on the kindness of God rather than hearing what God is saying to us in his good gifts and coming to repentance and faith in Jesus Christ. That's presumption. It's another reason for judgment. But the third reason that Paul gives is impenitence. He says in verse 5, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Uh, by, not, uh, by not receiving the goodness of God, the kindness of God, in allowing us to see the sinfulness of the world, but also seeing our own sinfulness in the light of it and running to Jesus Christ, those who are moralists, and in this context, Jewish moralists, um, ultimately are impenitent, and they too stand under the wrath of God. There's coming a day when our God will judge uh, and bring to account all those who stand against his sovereign rights over them as Lord. Well, what's the standard? If, if judgment is coming, not just against immoral, but even moral people, what's the standard for judgment? Well, in verses 6 to 16, Paul talks about this standard, and he says two things about the standard for judgment. It's impartial, and it's fair. In verses 6 to 11, he says that the standard is impartial, and it's interesting, actually, there's a, there's a structure that Paul uses here uh, called a chiasm. Uh, chiasm, and I've structured in your notes to show you how a chiasm works, um, but it's, it's basically, I think of it as a sandwich, uh, where you've got kind of pieces of bread on the outside, um, perhaps ch- cheese on the in- inside, and then the middle layer is the meat. It's, meant to f- it's a structure that's meant to focus you on the center of whatever the s- section is so that you actually see what's the point. What is the point that Paul's driving at? And so in verses 6 to 11, verses 6 and 11 parallel, verses 7 and 10 parallel, And the center, what Paul wants you to focus on, is verses 8 and 9. Um, So so verses 6 and 11, what does Paul say? Well, verse 6, he, God, will render to each one according to his works. Verse 11, for God shows no partiality. So if the standard, the divine standard for judgment is impartiality, Paul makes that point at the outset and in the conclusion. God will render to each one according to his works. God shows no partiality. And then verses 7 and 10, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory, honor, and immortality, he will give eternal life. Verse 10, but glory, honor, and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. You see how those parallel. So, So this impartial standard is, well, if you really seek for glory, honor, and immortality, well, God is impartial. He'll grant eternal life. But here's the rub. <laughs> Verse 8 and 9 is the center. Those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. So the center is what Paul's driving at. Judgment is real and is coming for all those who do evil, for all those who are self-seeking. Now here's the thing. That's every one of us. Paul's already told you that, and he's going to tell you that again, right? Immoral Gentile, well, that's pretty obvious that they're evil. But you moralists, guess what? You're in the same boat. You're a hypocrite. You're presumptuous. You're impenitent. And so God's standard, which is impartial, will actually bring judgment and tribulation 
and wrath upon all those um, who disobey his word. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, whether you're immoral, pagan, or moral, religious person, doesn't matter. Judgment is coming, and God's standard is impartial. But it's not just impartial, it's also fair. Uh, In verses 12 to 16, Paul says that it doesn't matter if you have Torah or not. If you know the first five books of the Old Testament, the revelation of God that shows forth God's divine standard, because, because God's written his law, if you will, natural law, upon everyone's heart. He says in verse 12, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. All who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. For when the Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they're a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts, while their conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them on that day when, according to my gospel, God judges the secrets of men by Christ Jesus. Whether you have the law like the Jews have, or whether you are a pagan Gentile who have the law of God written on your heart in your conscience, doesn't matter. This divine standard for judgment is fair because everyone ultimately has access to one fundamental reality, which is God is the Lord, and we all have something to do with him. And he's revealed himself in such a way that everyone knows by virtue of creation, there is a God, he is all-powerful, And he is going to judge the world. And because of that, we're without excuse. God's standard is impartial. He will apply it across the board, uh, whether to Jew or Gentile. And it's fair. Everyone has access to it. It's it's not as though anyone on Judgment Day will say, I didn't know there's a God. I may have denied there was a God. The fool says in his heart there is no God. In order to deny there, there is a God, you have to have a conception of a God to deny So even the atheist knows somewhere in his heart there is such a being as God that he is denying exists. Whether you claim there is no God or not, everyone has access to this divine standard of judgment, a fair standard that causes uh, everyone to be without excuse on that judgment day. So, So whether you're pagan Gentile, whether you are a moralist like the Jews, judgment's coming. But the thought should occur, well, wait a second. Aren't the Jews God's people? I mean, wasn't, aren't the Jews the ones that God is, has called out of, out of Egypt and established as a nation and given the law? And you have these Old Testament scriptures or that, from that age, the Bible itself, what we would call the Hebrew Bible. Don't if they're going to be judged just like the pagans, what advantage is there being a Jew? What, what, what difference does that make? Is there any advantage for being a Jew? Well, Paul is going to make the case, starting in chapter 2, verse 17, and really it runs all the way through chapter 3, verse 8. Now, actually, there, there were real advantages, and there are real advantages um, to being a Jew, uh, to to knowing the Bible and to serve as a witness to others and to have this sign of circumcision that marks you off as belonging to the people of God. In verse 17 says, But if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law and boast in God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law, and if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind and a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of children, having the law and the embodiment of knowledge and truth, You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? Now, Paul's not denying that being instructed in the law and having this mission to witness to others is somehow a bad thing. No, these are real advantages. The problem was the Jews did not use those advantages. They did not teach themselves the truth concerning God. They did not obey the law. They were not uh, appropriate witnesses. And in fact, verse 24, as it is written... The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Even circumcision, this sign of inclusion in the visible people of God that was meant to mark God's people out, well, it's only valuable if, it, if one actually penetrated 
beyond the sign to the things signified. Paul says in verse 25, for circumcision in, indeed is of value if you obey the law, but if you break the law, your circumcision becomes uncircumcision. For if a man who is uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? Then he who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law will condemn you who have the written code in circumcision but break the law. For no one is a Jew is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. What is Paul saying? It's a little confusing, isn't it? I, I think what Paul is saying is that circumcision is valuable, but only if one realizes that the sign's not the thing. The sign is meant to lead you to the thing signified. And if, if it doesn't lead you to the thing signified, which is the circumcision of the heart, a full-hearted trust in God, and particularly trust in God, in the God who has come to us in Jesus Christ, if circumcision doesn't lead you there, then it's worthless. And if, the, if a pagan Gentile comes to faith in Jesus Christ, even though he's uncircumcised, then he's actually gotten the benefit that circumcision was meant to show the Jews all along. Perhaps a way of getting at this for us today is simply to replace the word circumcision with baptism. Baptism is of value if you, if you, if you obey the point of baptism, uh, which is baptism is a sign that points you to Jesus Christ. So if a man who's unbaptized, unbaptized keeps the precepts of the law, that is, responds to the the purpose of the law by faith in Jesus Christ, will not his unbaptism be regarded as baptism? Then he who is physically baptized but keeps the law will condemn you who have, been, have the written code and baptism but break the law. For no one is a Christian who is merely one outwardly, nor is baptism outward and physical, but one is a, Jew, or one is a Christian inwardly, and baptism is a matter of the heart by the Spirit, not the letter. His praise is not from God but from men. You see how that, that helps you understand? The sign is not the thing. It's the thing signified that really matters. And so when we bring those of us who have been baptized as infants, relying on that baptism does you nothing. The baptism is meant to point you to Jesus. That's what Paul's saying. The Jews had the advantage of circumcision. They had the advantage of the sign. But the sign is of no value if it doesn't actually point you to the reality. You simply have these advantages and you didn't take advantage of them and so you stand condemned. It's what Paul says in, beginning in chapter 3, that the Jews were unfaithful and did not use their advantages. He uses five different descriptors um, for the Jews. He calls them unfaithful in verse 3. Um, faithless also in verse 3. Calls, he suggests they're liars in verse 4, unrighteous in verse 5, um, and speak in terms of my lie in verse 7. So he says, what if some were unfaithful? Does their faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means, let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you're, you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. But if our unrighteousness serves to show the righteousness of God, what shall we say? That God is unrighteousness to inflict wrath on us? I speak in a human way. By no means. For then how could God judge the world? But if through my lie God's truth abounds to his glory, why am I still being condemned as a sinner? And why not do evil that good may come as some people slanderously charge us with saying their con condemnation is just? Now Paul's drawing this, this contrast between Jewish unfaithfulness and God's faithfulness. But don't miss the point. The point is that, that, that the Jewish moralists who might condemn those Gentile sinners, they too stand under the wrath of God, under the judicial wrath of God. Because in the end, they had great advantages. They knew the Bible. They had a mission. They had these, this wonderful sign of circumcision, but they did not take advantage of those things. Because those things were meant to lead them to Jesus, ultimately. And they rejected the Savior who had come. And because of that, though, though they proved unfaithful, God would still remain faithful. Yet because of that, Jews as well stand under the condemnation of God. And so the first section, judicial wrath, stands against pagan Gentiles, against immoral Gentiles. The second part, 
God's judicial wrath stands against and condemns Jewish moralists. But in some then, starting chapter 3, verse 9, God's judicial wrath stands against us all. Because we're all under sin. And we're all sinners. Without exception and without exhaustion. You know, starting in chapter 3, verse 9, well really in verse 10, Paul quotes Old Testament Scripture after Old Testament Scripture and cobbles them together in this kind of collage of texts that, that, that are meant to prove that we are all sinners without exception and without exhaustion. So chapter 3, verse 9. What then? Are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. They, together they become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. And their paths are ruin and misery. And the way of peace they've not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So you hear that, right? We're all sinners. We all stand under, whether, whether we're pagan Gentiles or Jewish moralists, we all stand under sin, hence we all stand under God's judicial wrath, under his condemnation. Uh, we're sinners without exception. None is righteous. No, not one. None understands. No one seeks after God. All have turned aside. No one does good. Not even one. Over and over again, Paul drops that as a trip hammer. And he does so relying on Old Testament texts. In your notes, I have this chart where you have Romans 3 on one side and the Old Testament reference on the other. If you have an ESV study Bible, you'll recognize this. It's, it's embedded there uh, in the notes. But I think it's a really helpful chart to see that Paul's using these very Old Testament scriptures that the Jews themselves would have recognized. These are their scriptures. And he shows them that they too have this bad news <laughs> that without exception, they are sinners. They stand under the wrath of God. Um, there is condemnation that's coming because of their sinful condition, uh, but also because of uh, the, the extent of their sinfulness. Um, whether our words, whether our deeds, whether our thoughts, uh, in every place, thought, word, and deed, we show ourselves to be sinners. Uh, and so because of that, we're all without excuse. Chapter 3, verse 19 now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For the, by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Now, that's actually new information for us. Paul's going to pick that back up, especially in chapter 7. Um, but, but for our purposes here uh, this morning, Verses 19 and 20 really serve as the conclusion of Paul's argument in this section. The conclusion of the bad news. The bad news is God's judicial wrath has been revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of human beings. And that's true for everyone without exception. The most, the most beautiful child who's born into this world to the oldest human being who lives, whether you were a godless pagan Gentile or a moralistic religious person, a Jewish person, or even a professing Christian, doesn't matter who you are, God's wrath has been revealed because we have all sinned against God and we all deserve his wrath. Um, one application point before we move to discussion. Um, this is bad news. Um, it's only by understanding this, this bad news, uh, which is we deserve God's judgment because we all are sinners. It's only as we understand this that we will actually see the wonder of the gospel and run to Jesus Christ. But here's the application point. Uh, as, as those who profess to believe in Jesus Christ, and many of you leaders in this church, we have to hold on to this. The place where theological liberalism goes wrong uh, is in the denial of this reality. When we start to believe that human beings are really, in the end, fundamentally good, uh, when we come to believe that, well, we're, you know, we're, we're mixed, but, but, but fundamentally, we're good people, and our problem really isn't sin, 
our problems, ignorance or oppression or maladjustment or whatever it may be, whenever we get to that place, we actually have moved away from the witness of Scripture and we've actually moved away from the very basis of the gospel itself because it's not good, there's no good news for us that we will embrace in Jesus Christ if we don't understand that God's judicial wrath is revealed against heaven, against us, <laughs> against us, me, you, because of our sin. Because we stand, whether it's pagan Gentile or, or moralistic religious person, we stand under God's wrath. And if that's the case, if that's true, well then Jesus Christ is a Savior a savior from sin, a, sa- a savior from the judicial wrath to come, then he's a savior. Then we see his beauty and excellency. Then we want to run it. Then we want to tell others the good news of Jesus. But if we lose the bad news, if we move away from Paul's understanding and Scripture's understanding that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked, then suddenly we will move to all other sorts of solution steps outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's, that's, that's absolutely true. So that's where we need to take our stand um, in terms of how we approach our world. This, there's bad news. The wrath of God has been revealed. But the good news is that in Jesus Christ, God has made a way of salvation. As you've studied these passages, these three chapters this past week, undoubtedly you've seen a range of things. Talk around your tables one thing that you hadn't seen before that you saw this week or one thing that perhaps you heard this morning uh, that's caused you to say, hmm, okay, I see now why the bad news of of the gospel, if you will, is so necessary uh, so that we might understand the good news we have in Jesus Christ. Talk around your tables for the next 15 minutes or so.